Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our symposium, Energy Transition for a Sustainable Society, here in this Theatersaal of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, but in particular, um, those who join us online from a various number of countries and including a speaker, uh, two speakers of today's session. My name is Victor Bruckmann. I'm assisting the various tasks of the Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and I have the pleasure and honor to guide you through this afternoon. The event today marks one of the final activities uh, of the Joint Workgroup on Energy Transition that was installed by the Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies, GIAS, and the Climate and Air Quality Commission, KKL, of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. A more detailed explanation will follow, and therefore, without further ado, I would now ask Wolfgang Baum-Johann to deliver his welcome addresses. Professor Baum-Johann is the current president of the Division of Mathematics and Natural Sciences of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And before that, he was director of the Space Research Institute in Graz, certainly a function where he came across solar radiation and therefore energy-related questions as well. Wolfgang, the virtual floor is yours. Yes, I hope everybody can understand me. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all at this symposium, ladies, gentlemen, and colleagues. And uh, the symposium Energy Transition is led by the Academy's Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies and by the Climate and Air Quality Commission. They're working together on this topic, uh, looking at slightly different angles or from slightly different angles. And uh, I would also extend uh, my welcome to the whole presiding committee of the Academy, who is very interested in this energy climate change uh, conundrum, which is not easy. I think we have the long-standing issue uh, how do you get the energy when uh, kind of preventing or at least preventing partially so we may not be able to do more in the uh, remaining time uh, but it became even more apparent uh, because of the current energy crisis Russia invaded Ukraine and it got more and more difficult to at least uh, do something maybe it even helped a bit uh, to the transition, but it made clearer we have to make the transition. And the transition is really not so easy because first you have to find out where do you get the energy from, it was already mentioned, finally from the sun. I think even coal is uh, done by the sun essentially some million years ago. But nowadays it's mainly solar energy and it is uh, wind energy, but of course winds are driven by the sunlight. Meteorology is done by the sun itself. And uh, so you have to create the energy, but I think it all becomes more to the topic because we have to transport the energy to the consumer, to all of you, which is a bit more difficult. And also uh, at the very end, uh, you have to figure out how to store energy because if you rely on windmills and solar rays, you know the sun doesn't shine every day. Today would be a bad uh, for uh, solar rays. Uh, tomorrow is very good for windmills as far as I understand the weather report. But you have to kind of store energy in between and you cannot fill all alpine valleys with uh, dams, that's virtually impossible. So you have to find solution. And that's a very pressing issue. Also the Leopoldina, our sister academy in Germany, I'm also a member of the presiding committee of the Leopoldina, 
uh, made a report, very timely, uh, essentially directed to the politicians. Uh, I guess you all got a copy, at least from the German version. It's only the German version, English version will come. Uh, so, so I think it's also very timely to have the symposium uh, today. And uh, I really hope that you will come to some conclusions that helps one or the other business, how you create the energy, how you distribute it, and how you store it intermittently. And uh, you may not right, uh, come at the final conclusions, but I'm sure that this group or slightly different group uh, will go on within the academy uh, to do uh, the work for the coming years. I would like to thank all members of our commissions for interdisciplinary ecological studies and climate and air quality, as well as other members of the working group. And I would like to mention a few names, which actually did most of the work or will do the work by presenting lectures today. And that's Simone Gingrich, Robert Jandl, Lucy Pau, Georg Passeur, Kaywan uh, Riahi, Karl Steininger, and Wilfried Winniewater. And now I will let you work and present. And I will hand over to Verena Winniewater, the chairwoman of the Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies, and Wilfried Winniewater, co-chairman of the Climate and Air Quality Commission. Before doing so, please have an interesting and stimulating afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor baum -Johan, and also thank you for touching upon important issues such as conflicts. You mentioned more dams in valleys, and this is, of course, in conflict with biodiversity, for instance, and other crises we are tackling, especially in the Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies. And with this, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Verena Winiwata, the chair of this Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies. She is an environmental historian by training and focused and focuses her research activities on sustainability issues, both within and beyond the academy. Needless to say that energy transition touches upon many topics within the ecology and sustainability domain such as biodiversity, which I mentioned, but also the Agenda 2030, for instance, has a dedicated goal, goal number seven, that deals with energy. Professor Winitavata, the floor is yours. Thank you both. Um, um, the President Baum Johann and Victor Bruckmann, and let me also wish you a very interesting afternoon. Hello. Um, thank you also um, to the administration of the academy and all the technical personnel here making this um, hybrid event possible. The the question of this afternoon, the an energy transition for a sustainable society is definitely one of the biggest challenges um, in achieving the sustainable development goals, uh, creating a just, inclusive global society respecting the planetary boundaries of the possible. The instrument of the joint working groups in German GAGs, Gemeinsame Arbeitsgruppen of our two commissions, um, has been extremely fruitful over the past years. Uh, we had a joint working group on the SDGs themselves and what kind of challenges their implementation uh, produces for Austria, which was a joint, uh, an, a joint report. And we also had a high level meeting here discussing it. One of our other and less traditional uh, joint working groups uh, was about installing a webcam on the Jamtal Ferna, on one of the um, remaining glaciers of the Eastern Alps. Um, and I have had the, the Im impression that these 
joint working groups coming together for a particular topic or a particular task were an extremely efficient uh, tool uh, to bring to the fore all the unpaid work, the pro bono work of the members of commissions. None of the authors of any of those reports, none of the presenters receives any honorarium. This shows how much the Academy actually has a lever in creating absolutely high level content um, on the basis of the, of the neutrality and the scientific reputation of the Academy of Sciences. And it saddens the members of the Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies that this is the last event uh, which we can have together as the Commission, the Climate and Air Quality Commission sees its end by the 31st of um, March. We would hope that this theme is not um, left orphaned for too long. Um, and I think we will show everybody today what the joint work of these two commissions can achieve. I wish us all a very enlightening afternoon and thank you all for coming, be it here in the room or virtually. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, now I'd like to ask Wilfried Winiwater, Deputy Chair of the Commission for Climate and Air Quality, to deliver his welcome remarks and to provide an overview of the activities of the joint working group that was mentioned already several times now. And this working group is co-chaired by Wilfried Winiwater and uh, myself. Climate and air quality, ladies and gentlemen, is inherently linked to energy transition in many ways. Most obviously, of course, uh, the defossilization, and I'm using this term on purpose, of our energy system to mitigate climate change. But this is by far not the only connection as we will lear learn later today. Wilfried, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure f to welcome you on behalf of the Climate and Air Quality Commission here to this meeting. Actually, I may convey greetings to you by Georg Kasa, the chair of our commissions, who unfortunately has to be with a, uh, a very important uh, meeting at the uh, National Science Foundation of Austria uh, to talk about key funding aspects. So he could not join us today, but he would have very much liked to do so. Uh, because uh, this kind of sessions that we have today is what has been traditionally one of the great activities that uh, the Climate and Air Quality Commission uh, could deliver. Uh, we used to have uh, afternoon sessions like this uh, regularly uh, three or four times a year until November uh, 2019. So this is the first session that we can welcome you to after this uh, interruption. The topic energy transition has been motivated by discussions that we had with Georg Brasseur, who will give a presentation a little later today. And I, uh, uh, I'm glad that it was, uh, uh, it created so much uh, positive energy among members of both the uh, uh, Climate and Air Quality uh, Commission and the Commission of Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies that we could easily find a group of people who were willing to collaborate in this joint working group. What did we do? Since about a year ago, we had regular meetings and we invited to these meetings top experts uh, to give presentations, provide presentations to us via Zoom. That was very easily done. So we could uh, find experts globally. Uh, and um, from these presentations, we asked questions. And then uh, form, uh, we, we uh, brought that all into a report on both the exciting physical science of energy transitions, what has been developed, 
and what uh, is still to be developed in the future, and also the social aspects. How much energy do we actually need as people? Uh, we put that all together into a report that is has just been finalized. We, everybody who has uh, left their email addresses with us will within two or three weeks receive the final version. If you have not left your email address yet, please do so and we can provide you with this volume like we can do with the, with the link to the, to the uh, re record of this very session. Um, so, uh, what you will hear today is not actually a reproduction of this report, but is a recollection of what people who authored this report have, what they find important in this regard. So it is closely connected, but it's not absolutely the same. If any of you has specific interest, urgent interest, to get a pre-release of uh, the report, please let me know. We have a couple of printed uh, versions that we can share, but this is uh, still uh, subject to copy, edit, and uh, uh, there may be some changes to come still. Uh, the topic, energy transition, is highly relevant, as we also have heard already by Professor Baum-Johann, Leopoldina just yesterday issued a report. So the fact that we are almost ready at the same time uh, speaks more for the relevance of what we are doing than uh, having missed an opportunity. And you will hear that certain aspects are, uh, I think, more closely and, and in more depth being dealt with uh, during uh, in, in, in the work that uh, the colleagues of, uh, in Austria did. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to a number of great presentations. Yeah, thank you, Wilfried, for providing a comprehensive overview. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, let me do some housekeeping. We will have time for discussion after each presentation, enough time, I hope. And online participants are able to interact with a text box and you can post your question at any time, also during the um, presentations. I'm saying this now so that you don't need to save uh, your questions. You can do so anytime. I will receive them on an iPad and try to include them as best and as good as I can during the discussion for all participants on site, it means you should please use a microphone and wait for the microphone um, when you engage in the discussion later on so that the online participants could follow your comments or questions. Let's start with the first block, context and renewable energy limitations as indicated in the program. And I am really delightful to um, uh, invite Simone Gingrich to come forward to the stage, she is a senior researcher at the Institute for Social Ecology of the University for Natural Resources and Life Sciences, BOKU, in Vienna. She is member of the Young Academy and also member of the Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies. Her research covers the social sciences aspects of energy transition, including environmental history, sustainability issues during industrialization, land and resource use, and social ecological metabolism. She will now elaborate on historical energy transitions and reflect upon challenges we are facing now. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction. I'm very happy to be here today and also to have the honor and freedom to be the first speaker. So 
Um, when preparing this talk, I was uh, thinking also about the types of topics that I would like us uh, to discuss today, or the, it's kind of a, a wish list also for issues that I find relevant in the context of um, energy transitions. And um, so what I, what I uh, prepared uh, was to uh, present some very generalized facts about historical energy transitions. My own work, as uh, Victor Bruckmann has um, announced, is on uh, is in social ecology. That's a sustainability science, and uh, I study mostly long-term processes, so industrialization processes covering uh, 100 or 200 years. And I look at how uh, res resource use changes, and how and energy is one part of that. How um, land use changes, for example. So I use this uh, lens, uh, also trying to bridge social and biophysical phenomena uh, to talk about energy transitions of the past. And um, I will uh, present very general biophysical characteristics of historical energy transitions, uh, two types of such uh, um, characteristic, one looking at biophysical processes, um, that I will uh, explain in a little bit. And then I will also touch about uh, upon the political uh, motivations or uh, dimensions of energy transitions and some of their cultural implications. Here I will draw on uh, environmental history research um, that has very important um, contributions to make here. Um, so, uh, and I will use these uh, generalized facts or these uh, partly it's uh, observations, hypotheses or um, observations uh, to also try to draw some very general implications for the present challenges. And um, I, I observe and I'm, I'm very happy also about the introduction um, uh, much of the debate around energy transitions is often framed as a technical uh, debate and, and I try to bring in a more um, multidimensional uh, perspective focusing also on uh, social dimensions. So uh, very generally, and again, I abuse my role as the first speaker, so I show some uh, very rough uh, graphs. Um, global historical energy transitions can be displayed, uh, as you see in this figure, uh, total global primary energy consumption since 1800. Um, this uh, compilation shows uh, very vividly that um, energy use in the past has uh, grown tremendously and that uh, historical energy transitions were additive uh, processes. So um, the introduction of new energy carriers or new energy sources in the past, uh, first coal, then oil and natural gas, uh, tended to coincide not with a reduction of the energy use uh, of the sources prevailing before, but usually added to them. So the renewable energy sources that are being used are uh, used on top of previal, uh, previously um, existing fossil energy. Um, and this uh, addition and, and continuation of growth in, in fossil energy use is also among the root causes of global, of the global climate crisis, climate crisis. And, uh, again, as the first speaker, I allow myself to show you a figure that probably many of you know. Uh, in the last uh, IPCC report, we see very prominently that, uh, uh uh, greenhouse gas emissions from fossil energy, that's the blue area in the bottom of the graph, um, are not only the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions, but they have also increased uh, in absolute as well as in relative terms uh, since 1990. In the very recent past, the relative contribution um, has slightly gone down. Yes, so um, fossil energy use, despite the ongoing uh, energy transition towards more renewables, is one of the major drivers of the global climate crisis today. Now, um, I go from the very global course into the more uh, case-specific work, and I want to focus on um, the 
energy transition in industrialized countries, um, in particular in the global north, where I uh, would like to quote an environmental and economic uh, historian, Paul Ward, who has done a lot of energy history work and looked into the use of um, uh, energy in the past, in particular the use of firewood. And uh, of course, working in, with historical data, we always face uh, the problem of, of data robustness or how to how to interpret sources. And um, he has uh, written a paper on um, in which he really uh, reflects on his knowledge about the reconstruction of firewood consumption from diverse historical sources um, in a, a number of uh, countries uh, in the global north mostly. And there he comes to the conclusion that the availability of firewood, so the availability of biomass uh, to potential users is a key and possibly a more significant factor than climate in explaining how much uh, firewood people actually needed. So pre-industrial levels of uh, firewood use in his interpretation were driven by supply rather than demand. Yeah, and I find this quite um, interesting uh, that not only does energy use increase in time when new technologies or new energy sources become available, but also in the past, um, it appears that under, uh, um, depending on the supply of uh, fuel wood availability, people just burn more if they have the chance, if the wood is there. Yeah. Um, and the, the second part uh, of this argument is, is one that my own research has also contributed to, is this, this early uh, energy transition from wood fuel towards uh, coal uh, that we see in many industrial or in industrialized countries in, in Austria, for example, in the 19th century, um, enabled a transgression of these supply limitations. So um, uh, uh, Rolf Peter Sieferle, a very renowned environmental historian, uh, made the argument or ca called this phenomenon the subterranean forest in the 1980s. And he describes the access to coal as the access to the, the forest underground. And on the right, I show you a figure, and I forgive the colleagues of, of Kios, some of whom have seen a previous version of this. Um, uh, that's some of my own work that dealt with questions of energy use um, recently, where we quantified the hypothetical forest change in different uh, scenarios, um, counterfactual scenarios of the past. And we showed that actually um, the use of cold coal uh, enabled increasing energy use while forests recovered. And in a counterfactual scenario, we showed that uh, in the absence of this coal use in Austria, forest biomass would have gone down to zero in the beginning of the 20th century. So this subterranean forest is really displayed in this, um, in this hit historical scenario analysis. Yeah, so these are the, the biophysical um, characteristics of historical forest transitions that I wanted to describe. And now um, I'm turning to more um, social and cultural dimensions of historical forest transition, uh, sorry, <laughs> historical energy transition, sorry. Um, and uh, uh, here I want to make the point that uh, Earlier I said, okay, the availability of new energy sources or the access to new energy sources as if this was something that just sort of happened, yes. Uh, of course, this didn't just happen. There were actors involved, there, was, there were interests involved, there were people involved. And there is very exciting um, environmental history research and also something that I want to uh, contribute to advancing myself on the agency in these um, historical uh, energy transitions. Um, and uh, I, here I want to quote colleagues um, at the Institute of Social Ecology who uh, studied the transition to oil in Europe in the, uh, after World War II. And they showed that uh, the European recovery program, so the funding spent by the US on European um, infrastructure development and the OEEC, the Organization for uh, European Economic Cooperation, pushed Western Europe towards the shift to 
uh, to crude oil, to petroleum, and also towards petroleum dependency. And they looked at France and looked at um, legal changes and the uh, decisions of uh, funding spent, of refineries built, and of um, uh, fundings directed to particular refineries and show or they describe um, the OEEC, for example, as a system entangler, as an institution that really uh, shapes this shift towards um, new energy carriers. Yeah, so, uh, and if we, if we try to frame this positively, um, we see that there is actually not just a physical um, uh, necessity that happens, but there are actors and decisions and funding involved in shaping energy use and also uh, creating long-term uh, legacies. Um, and then uh, just briefly here, uh, I, I quote a very um, seminal and, uh, well, 30-year-old uh, concept in environmental history that um, uh, to make the point that uh, energy transitions are not only a biophysical and a political phenomenon, they also have cultural implications. And here, uh, Christian Pfister, uh, a Swiss environmental historian, coined the term uh, the 1950s syndrome that describes one such uh, cultural uh, implication of historical energy transitions. Um, and this is actually a, a photograph he shows in his 1994 uh, paper, um, in which uh, he describes how the abundance not only of oil but also in particular of the cheap uh, oil to consumers in Europe after World War II, so the same period, led to the rise of what he calls the consumer society, Konsumgesellschaft, um, that has not only far-reaching changes um, in terms of lifestyle or practices, what do people do in their daily lives, but also affects people's values. Yeah, so new values come in in terms of mobility, freedom, um, and and consumerism that help define what makes people happy or what they what they value after all. So. Um, this is to say energy is not just something uh, social, political, biophysical, but also has cultural implications um, that we have to consider. And also we have to consider when talking about uh, future energy transitions, because they may be uh, hindered, for example, by these, um, by these values still attached to uh, historical or to, to the existing energy system. So um, I come to my um, to the the last point in my presentation. What are the the implications for current for present challenges? And here I put beyond working towards powerful, and I should add um, uh, resilient or, or uh, um, reliable uh, renewable energy systems, because this is something I am aware many others will discuss today. Um, but I want to highlight uh, three points based on what I uh, talked about earlier. So uh, the first um, uh, implication that I want to draw your attention to is that uh, work on current energy transitions needs to acknowledge the importance of rapidly reducing energy use in industrialized countries. And um, here I'm, uh, I see a lot of potential in uh, contributions um, currently existing in social science energy research. For example, in the recent IPCC report, there was um, a particular chapter on demand side strategies where uh, it was shown that there are a lot of options to reduce energy use without compromising well-being by avoiding some kinds of energy use, shifting technologies, and then improving uh, technologies. Yeah? So the improve would probably, and, and some of the shift would be the technical solution, uh, but also the avoidance of some uh, emissions um, plays an important role that I think needs to be highlighted more. And here I put... Uh, uh, and another direction here is also the work on energy needs. That is something that we discussed in the working group, um, where there is also a lot of social science research about how much energy do people actually need uh, to for decent living. Um, and I put here also, while safeguarding existing carbon sinks, I talked about the connection between energy use and, and uh, 
biomass. So um, maybe that's something we can also uh, further discuss after uh, Robert Yandel's uh, presentation on um, on biomass use. So the question, how can we reduce energy and at the same time uh, try to uh, collect or, or sequester carbon out of the atmosphere and back into um, ecosystems, for example. Um, the second point, uh, I, a second implication I want to draw from uh, the work I have presented is that work on energy transitions needs to address not only the challenge of using less energy and moving towards renewables, but also of actively phasing out of fossils. I mean, we saw that just because other uh, energy sources are available does not mean that um, uh, the previous ones will be used less. Um, and this is both a biophysical problem in terms of infrastructure here. This figure shows you a paper that came out already four years ago on uh, committed emissions, so emissions that happen due to planned infrastructure either already built or to be built. And it shows that actually this existing infrastructure is sufficient to uh, uh, jeopardize the Paris Agreement 1.5 target. Yeah, Just because there are still coal power plants being built um, that they would, and, and uh, industry and road infrastructure, etc., they would um, suffice to jeopardize uh, the 1.5 target. So it, it will be a challenge to actually divest from such um, uh, infrastructure. And uh, this is a, a physical problem. In new other infrastructure needs to be built, but it's also, uh, of course, a sociopolitical one. There are investments, there are existing contracts, vested interests, etc. And um, to conclude, and I'm sorry for the for the messy image. I did this at <laughs> one o'clock at noon today, so um, this was the best uh, I could find. But I thought um, maybe it's good to establish a link to the uh, recently published uh, uh, special report on climate friendly living in Austria um, that I think some of the colleagues in the room co-authored. Um, so I, I use this image to highlight that we also, when working towards energy transitions in the future, we need to create awareness or deal with the fact that uh, they are also sociocultural uh, challenges. Yeah, And um, here the discussion around social movements comes in that I wrote a little um, text on for the report. Um, also Ilona Otto's work, uh, I'm, uh, she was also part of the of the working group on, on social tipping elements falls in here or provides uh, relevant input here. And um, another concept uh, that I, this is the image that I want to uh, finish with is the idea of leverage points that I find very promising and that I'm using in, an, in a project that has recently started to understand uh, the uh, current and potentials uh, for working towards reducing emissions. Um, this is a concept originally coined by Donella Meadows, a systems researcher, um, where she argues that interventions into systems like an energy system can be done at multiple um, uh, levels and uh, often uh, political interventions and that is what this figure shows political interventions tend to focus on the on the parameters uh, so on, on, on in what she calls uh, shallow leverage points uh, without tackling the deeper leverage points, the underlying processes in the system, uh, such as, for example, values or um, underlying intents of uh, activities. Yeah, and um, so understanding with which rationales are political decisions being made or what are the directions that societies or, or uh, states actually want to uh, take resource use too. Uh, that is something that I'm very um, interested in and I hope uh, to contribute to advancing research in that direction. And with this, uh, I will end and those are the references I showed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Simone. And, um I think you have made it clear that uh, energy transition is 
not just a pure technocratic exercise. And also what you showed, which is very valuable in my opinion, the historical context in view of biomass and forest biomass. I'm sure we will hear more about this in the next presentation. But in fact, there are forests that are still suffering from an increasing, from an overuse in the past. And this is still visible nowadays. So I will now open the floor for discussions. We have a microphone and I will also monitor comments and, and questions from the online audience. Manfred Grasserbauer, Technische Universität Wien. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation, but I'm a, a technical person and not a sociologist. Could you give one very clear example of the social tipping point and of the leverage? Um, so, yes, so the leverage points, uh, they would, for example, um, you would be able, or what we do is to classify new laws or subsidies or um, new, uh, for example, tax changes in taxes within this scale. Yes, so those would be um, intervention points. The, the, yes, yeah. Yes, well, the. No, I mean the, the tipping elements, and it's a pity Ilona is not with us. She could explain much better. But they did research on the question: how, which nonlinear social processes are required in order to get out of fossil dependence? And so they identified, and they they did a lot of. Um, and I don't know if co-authors are in the room. Then please uh, speak up, because no. Um, so they did a lot of literature survey, expert survey, and they identified uh, examples for, for the um, uh, elements within which these uh, tipping interventions could take place uh, is, for example, more information on fossil fuels. Uh, so who, who use or who extracts what, who gains what, uh, education on climate, but also infrastructure development, uh, values uh, is another education. Education. So the various dimensions within which uh, particular nonlinear processes can or need to happen in order to step out. I can. I will share. I will send you the link to the to the paper. She, yeah. There's a question over there. Uh, Rudi Frivert, ex hefi uh, Does phasing out fossil fuels also include phasing out nuclear energy? I mean, the way I talked about it right now, I meant uh, phasing out fossil fuels. Um, and I know that there are very um, strong opinions ab about the importance or um, uh, to, to remain or to still use nuclear energy and others saying that the risk are too high. Personally, I never uh, dealt with it uh, with nuclear energy in a, a scientific sense. So I'm speaking as a citizen and I would say uh, I think the risks are very high. So I wouldn't go, uh, I wouldn't advise anyone on building new nuclear. Um, and I would instead, uh, again, suggest to reduce energy use rather than focusing too much on nuclear. But really, I have never worked on it myself. Christian? I have an observation on the first two slides that you showed with the graphs, uh, which doesn't deal with the main part of your talk, but considering how over these hundred something years or more, the technology has changed and uh, the applications have multiplied, let's say, and uh, the uh, enticement uh, to have energy guzzlers in every house and every home has increased over the time. I find it interesting that even though you show kind of a very steeply uh, increasing curve, but when you normalize that to the increase in population during that time, mm. suddenly it's not all that steep anymore. Mm. So um, I think that's something to consider. Mm. 
that we're talking about, you know, so much energy is being used. But, you know, since the late 19 or 1800s, the population has multiplied by a factor of 10. Mm. So obviously the energy use has been multiplied too in output and whatever else. So I don't think, uh, you know, these dramatic curves can weigh uh, the whole conclusion that one has to draw. I, I fully agree. Of course, population is a major factor and... Um, and also a lot of efficiency gains have been made in the period, yeah. Uh, my perspective is more um, informed by a strong sustainability view of uh, sustainability challenges in which not only the question how much uh, does society gain from a particular use of resources, but also how much can ecosystems handle. And that's why I showed this figure to show what is causing the emissions like the, and the atmosphere doesn't care how many people there are. They just care or, how, or who uses what or emits what. They just... Uh, it just sees the CO2 emissions. That was the link I wanted to establish. But of course, I agree. Uh, population is a major um, is a major factor. It's one driver of many. Um. Yeah. Thank you. I have I have to say we have to move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Simone. And I'm now happy to announce. Robert Jandl, who is member of the directorate staff of the Austrian Research Center for Forests and head of the unit for climate impact research coordination. Robert is also a member of the Climate and Air Quality Commission of the Academy of Sciences and one of the key experts in forest biomass research in Austria. And this is, of course, also facilitated by the fact that he is located at the source of information from the natural National Forest Inventory that is coordinated in his institute. He will now elaborate on the potential role of biomass in energy transition. The floor is yours. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Victor, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk here today. Uh, I'm going to uh, cover the, the topic uh, availability of bioenergy uh, from domestic and European uh, woody biomass. So. An upfront remark, and that's impo important. We foresters, we are not uh, happy tree burners. We want to produce wood that can be used for many innovative, long-lasting products. And along this way of uh, wood product production, we have this side stream of bioenergy that's useful and partially lucrative. The topics I'm uh, going to uh, cover is um, first, should we talk about bioenergy from woody biomass? And the answer certainly from a forester's view is yes, we, we should. Uh, second uh, question is, is bioenergy going to be uh, some kind of game changer in the, in the energy transition? And there, our strong belief is it's not going to be. It's been, uh, it's going to be a marginal but uh, uh, important uh, source of energy. And uh, we have a big debate in Austria, in Europe, probably worldwide, uh, about uh, ecological concerns of the use of uh, bioenergy. And uh, I'm going to make the point that we think we can provide this energy in a sustainable manner. Here is uh, the split of energy for Europe, and I'm, uh, we are going to see uh, similar pictures very often today. In the left part in the circle, we have uh, the, the big gray sector, that's the fossil energy and the green sector, it's renewable 
energy. 17% uh, 17 of the energy uh, supply uh, in, in Europe is renewable energy. So renewable energy, we know that's uh, many different sources, that's hydropower, solar, wind, uh, also nuclear power. And um, bioenergy is uh, uh, making up uh, 60%, roughly 60% of this uh, renewable energy. And bioenergy, again, can be divided into biofuels, bioelectricity, and 74% uh, of this bioenergy in Europe is uh, uh, biomass for uh, heating and cooling. The expectations on bioenergy are uh, considerable. Here we see it in a, a time graph. X-axis goes from the year 2005 to the year, year 2050. And uh, what we can see is that the consumption of bioenergy in uh, Europe has been increasing uh, uh, quite a bit. And the models are the diverging uh, whether it's going to increase decrease or stay stable in, in, in the future. A big political debate that's going on is on the use of primary biomass. Uh, primary biomass is, is, is the buzzword uh, here. Uh, should we use primary biomass for energy production? And uh, on the, the the entire tree that I'm showing here, well, that does not work for me. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, the, uh, in, in the EU negotiation, in the discussion, the entire tree, from the tree top to the tip of the roots, is primary biomass. And uh, there, are, there is this intention to reduce this, uh, this use of primary biomass from a forester sector, uh, uh, a forester's point of view, we think we have a more refined uh, view on primary biomass. So first there's the root system that we are not considering as a source of energy. Then we have a stem that we want to turn into valuable wood products. And above this stem, there is a section that we could turn into pulp and paper and into energy. So. Um, this discussion would be helpful on on a, on a political sector, but uh, but we are um, we are kind of talking about primary biomass as uh, as an entity that, that's uh, insufficiently uh, distinguished in in in, uh, in our understanding. Now. Biomass for energy in the European Union. I first want to focus on the, on the red numbers. So 37% of the European bioenergy mix is primary biomass. 49% is industrial uh, byproducts. This is the side stream of wood processing that I've been uh, talking about. And 14% is of uh, unclear origin. Now, going back to this 37% uh, uh, primary biomass, of these 37%, uh, uh, roughly half is stem wood, and the other half is branches and tops. And now when we say, well, 50% stem wood, that's, uh, or 47% stem wood, that's a lot, that's too much, that's, uh, this should, uh, should be less. Why do we have uh, this 47% stem wood? Now, uh, the uh, picture on the, on the right side, the, uh, I'm trying again, if that works for me. Oh. Does it? Ha! Huh? <laughs> um, uh, th this is a so-called coppice forest um, in, in uh, German, that's Niederwald. Uh, in, in Central Europe, uh, coppices uh, have been kind of uh, traditional uses of, of uh, forest land where people wanted to make fuel wood for, for their own purpose. 
Um, Coppice is, uh, is a form of uh, forest management of the past from an Austrian perspective. But when we take, uh, when, when we now look at, at uh, all Europe, then there, there's uh, many countries, particularly in uh, the Mediterranean area, where coppice is dominant. And this is contributing a lot of stem wood as primary biomass for, for fuel. The picture in the, in the center is another source of stem wood of primary biomass. But what you see here is a forest that has been uh, uh, damaged by a storm. And this stem wood is no longer suitable uh, for processing. So this is energetically used. And uh, the picture uh, on the bottom is uh, a tree that's infested by bark beetles. Also, this uh, timber is devalued and is energetically used. So the philosophy, the, the, the thinking in Austria is use this wood for bioenergy that's not suitable for other forms of, uh, uh, of timber processing. Now, in Europe, we, we have a huge heterogeneity bet between countries. In the Nordic countries, we have a highly developed timber and paper industry. So a lot of timber is processed and a lot of bioenergy is uh, created in this side stream of, of timber processing. France, Italy, Spain are totally different in that respect. Uh, Neither of these countries has have developed a big timber processing industry. So without the timber uh, processing industry, you also do not have the, the, ener the energy side stream. Uh, for France, uh, uh, a colleague told me recently, uh, valuable oak timber is uh, exported to countries uh, someplace in Asia just because the market and the infrastructure is not available in, in, in France. Now, Austria uh, is uh, having a highly developed uh, timber industry. And with this highly developed uh, tim timber industry, we have both, we have the wood products and we have the, the, the side stream bioenergy. Uh, final uh, line here, Southeastern Europe, Hardly any timber industry, mostly fuel wood. So quite a, a, a variety of situations. Well, I'm skipping that. Now uh, let's uh, uh, go to the, to the Austrian forest. That's a busy graph and, and I walk you through that. The, the x-axis uh, is time going from 1961 to 2021. And the green bars, is the forest area. And, and you see the forest area has been increasing from 3.7 million hectares in 1960 to four, more than 4 million hectares presently. This is 10 times the, 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 the size of the city of Vienna. So we have a huge increase in, in the forest area, mostly at the expense of cropland and grassland. The, dark line is uh, the, the, the standing stock of biomass that we have. And uh, again, see in 1960, we had a, a standing stock of stem wood of 700, uh, 780 million cubic meter. And now, 60 years later, we have uh, 1.2 billion cubic meter, uh, meter standing biomass. So no, no wonder when we have this increase in, in um, standing stock, this increase in biomass, uh, a forester thinks, hey, what can we do with that? Uh, what we have been doing so far with it was, uh, I'm, I'm showing now this, oh, yeah, the, this uh, ellipsis here. When, when you uh, follow these ellipses uh, uh, back uh, in, in time, that's the harvesting level. 50, 60 years ago, we have been harvesting 14 million cubic meter of, of timber every year. We have been 
almost doubling the, 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 the harvesting rate and still are seeing an increase in the standing stock. So certainly we, we, we are seeing an, an opportunity to uh, create more wood products and again, side stream uh, bioenergy. This diagram, I'm, uh, I'm showing that just to prove that, that uh, I'm uh, uh, getting the, these figures from, uh, from someplace real. Shows the, 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 the wood flows in Austria. Um, the input to, to the entire wood uh, processing cycle is uh, uh, coming from domestically grown wood. Trying again. No. Not my friend. <laughs> um, um, Austria is harvesting uh, between one and two percent of, of the forest area every year, so, 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 uh, so roughly. Then uh, we have a lot of import of, uh, uh, of timber and overall the, 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 the input uh, to the wood processing sector is 43 million cubic meters of, of uh, wood annually. And the energy that's uh, released uh, from this uh, 43.4 million uh, cubic meter of, of uh, timber is uh, 24.8 million cubic meter. So roughly 50% of, uh, uh, of the timber is eventually transformed to bioenergy. But what this diagram is, uh, should show is that this timber is actually in a, in a product cycle, that we are not straightly uh, burning the timber, but that we are using, that we are producing wood products and the side stream is bioenergy. The, yeah, thanks, <laughs> new friend. Mm -hmm. uh, no, ich, ich möchte jetzt eins weiterschalten. Wie komme ich ein Slide weiter? Ah, okay. Gut. Und mit dem Laser. Okay, gut. Well, uh, simplified, uh, simplified uh, graph for what we are doing with the forest biomass. We are producing a lot of energy, but we are making a lot of this energy via uh, wood products of, of uh, different uh, longevities. When we are harvesting even more biomass, and I, I think that the, the, the graph first has shown that we see some, some potential here, then we could increase the side stream of biomass uh, generated from Wood production, what we do not want to increase is the flow of forest biomass into fuel wood and pellets directly into energy. Now energy supply of Austria. This uh, uh, graph shows the time span from 2005 to 2022. The grayish shades are the, the, the fossil fuels. The happier colors are uh, uh, renewable sources of energy, and the green, the green area is bioenergy, and 80% uh, of this bioenergy is coming from woody biomass. What we can see here is that the bioenergy sector has already expanding, at least since 2005. So the, the sector is already delivering a lot of energy and its uh, further increases are certainly possible, but they will not be very relevant for, for, for the total picture of, uh, uh, of the energy supply of the country. So I, I guess we, we have reached a certain level of energy provision from bioenergy. We can, when we increase the harvesting level by 10%, we can crank it a little bit up, but we, we are not going to, to make the, the big difference. 
Supply security, not a topic of, of my presentation, but I'm sure it's, uh, it's going to come up uh, later today. Um, many uh, solar and wind are not reliable sources. We, 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 we need to find uh, ways of uh, storing that. Uh, uh, biomass certainly can be stored and can be used on demand. My, yeah, I have two more, uh, two slides to, uh, to go. What I'm, uh, what I want to get at finally is, uh, this, uh, this is a, uh, um, a chart of the price for different kinds of timber. And what you see is that the two red lines have been recently connecting. This, this is the point. So what has been happening here? The, the, the red line is hardwood. And uh, hardwood is usually uh, not, uh, hardwood is uh, beech, for instance, is usually not selling very, uh, very well. The, the, the demand is usually not very high. And just last, and, and, and the, the price for fuel wood is always lower than the price uh, for construction wood. And only last year, for, for the first time that uh, we are uh, aware of has uh, been that the price for beach fuel wood was the same as the, 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 the price for beach construction uh, wood. And uh, we certainly have been following this in, in the newspapers. People were just eager to, to buy some, um, uh, some fuel wood. So this is a, uh, this is a process of where we are not happy with. We, we, uh, we, we can understand it from a buyer's uh, or for, from a producer's uh, position, but it's not what, what we like to have. Now, uh, three narratives. These uh, pictures are, all have been taken in, in, in the last winter. In, in urban areas, we, we are stuck with the source of uh, heating, source of energy that we have in our houses. We, we, we are not uh, having a lot of opportunities. What uh, I've been uh, observing and what uh, people in, in Upper Austria have been telling me that whoever has a garage available has been stocking up on, on fuel wood because uh, the, the, the price of uh, fossil energy sources has been, uh, has been uh, rising and people just went after this fuel wood. And also in the, in, in the forest, there, there is these piles of, of fresh wood where, where people are saying, well, this is what I'm uh, using for, for my heating in the, in the next uh, summer. This small pile of wood uh, gets me over, say, two, three months for, for my apartment. So people are responding to uh, the what, what we probably understand as energy crisis. Conclusions, emphasis again, foresters want to, want to produce products, wood products, not energy. Energy is the side stream. Energy from woody biomass is not a game changer for Europe. It has a rather small contribution to the uh, total energy demand in Europe, but locally, regionally, it's relevant. It's an important source of the energy mix in many countries. In Austria, 30%, 17%, so, so in, 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 the, uh, in, in this range. Uh, it uh, mostly provides heat in rural areas. This is uh, particularly true in Austria and in Nordic countries. A further expansion of the bioenergy uh, production is limited, at least for Austria. It's, I'm, I'm not sure about how other uh, country representatives uh, would uh, see that. And there are many uh, synergies with forest, uh, forest management. This would be the topic of another talk, but we... Uh, see many reasons why we could provide biomass for energy use. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Robert, for this comprehensive overview. And I think you have made it clear that it's not easy to just ramp up additional biomass production um, because it's 
were linked to the timber industry. And another important fact is that it is a very regional issue. There are regions where it, biomass is an important factor and will still be an important factor in future, whereas there are other regions where it will not play a main role. But I'm sure there are questions, ladies and gentlemen, and I see Gerhard's hand up. Well, uh, just a comment rather than a question. Uh, globally, uh, this uh, impression we got today, it's timber or energy is also, there are these non-timber forest products, the, the food, the, the, the fibers, the dyes, chemicals and everything. Uh, even in Austria, uh, one of the most intensive use of forest was production of potash. You would burn a forest and get less than 1% potash, which was then used in glass and in soaps and so on. So uh, I think <laughs> for the current Austrian perspective, the division in timber and energy is okay, but I think even uh, here we, we should teach that there's, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's uh, are these non-timber forest products also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you say that the, the, the further expansion of biomass use in Austria is limited. But why is it limited? Prices went up, so there is a huge stock of biomass. Is it forbidden, or what is the reason for this limitation? We, uh, for, for that, we have simulation studies. Uh, and uh, we, we have seen, uh, we, we made such a 100-year uh, simulation once, uh, a couple of years ago, where we were interested, if we take the renewable energy directive, uh, the, the, the first version, the first release, serious, uh, and uh, how long can we uh, how long can we last with uh, with our uh, forests? And we came to only 80 years. So if we really uh, take out all the the, 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 the timber for, for wood, uh, because we have an instant demand, then we are done in a couple of decades. So it, uh, sustainability is, is the issue. It's a political question, isn't it? So then it's a, a political question to, to forbid this kind of use. So this is just a simulation. It says there is wood for eight years. But eight. If, if prices for, for fuel biomass went up that, that sharp as we see it now, yeah. then there are market actors which are interested to, to sell yes, this. Uh, uh, yes, well, uh, and, and we have a forest act that puts very narrow uh, limitations on, on the so, so, uh, susti uh, sustainability is kind of ingrained in, uh, in, in this forest law. So we, uh, uh, an over-utilization of forests, according to the Austrian law, is impossible. But here I'm only, only talking Austria. We, we, when, when you follow the newspapers, there are other countries, Bulgaria, Romania, you, you name it. Um, that, that there might be some loopholes uh, that are um, that are wide open. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Um, do you have an idea how the ongoing uh, rise of temperatures and the change in the in the climate, uh, usually called klimawandel or climate crisis? Um, will affect standing timber and in particular how much of that timber is going to be useful as sawmill timber and how much is simply going to be blown by storms and then has to be used for other purposes? Yes, again, simulation studies. We are, we are very concerned. We are, we are, we are very concerned because we, we see this huge... Uh, 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 increase of, of, of damages and uh, you, you call it climate change. So, so uh, this is the trigger. The, the, the trigger is pulled and whether or not such a, a damaging event occurs, 
depends on regional local factors, but uh, we, uh, we, uh, we really uh, see or we, we expect increasing uh, uh, damages uh, in the future and um, ways of, of, of protecting the, the, the forests are elaborated, but it's, it's, it's not that we have uh, the, the, the solution at hand. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for, for a very insightful uh, presentation. I, if, I, if you allow me, I would have two very quick questions. Uh, one is directly following up on uh, Verena's question. Um, we uh, made a reanalysis of the IPCC pathways and we looked at um, basically what happens to the forest if we stabilize concentrations. And we found out that actually 30% of all the IPCC pathways, the forest in the future becomes a source instead yes. of a sink because of not taking any climate impacts into account. Um, uh, do you consider this in your, in your analysis? And, and then my second follow-up question on that is, um, I, I was wondering, I mean, Austria is really an agricultural exporting country. So we, we have lots of agricultural areas that is basically for production beyond agricultural food of Austria. Um, uh, wouldn't it be an option to uh, use some of the agricultural land for new forest land and enhance to that, at one hand, the carbon uh, capture capacity of mm -hmm. the Austrian sink in the forest, but also the, 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 the bioenergy um, yeah. uh, production? So I was wondering um, whether you take that into account, uh, whether, because that could be a source where you can increase energy. Use. Yes, so, so I'm, I'm trying to be brief on, 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 on uh, both questions. Um, uh, first questions, uh, uh, yes, uh, we, we realize that our forests are currently a carbon sink, but they will not be in, in the long run. The, uh, our forests are currently a, car uh, a carbon sink, and this is my link to Simone's uh, talk, because these forests have been degraded, they have been uh, overexploited, uh, they have been less wisely managed than, uh, uh, than we do it. <laughs> um, so, uh, they're, they're, they're below the, a reference level, and now they are catching up. And we see that the, the, the forests are going to catch up for a couple of decades more, but not forever. And, um, uh, the, 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 and, and we cannot say when we have reached a new uh, reference level, but we are decades away, not centuries. Um, and the second question is, uh, uh, could we use new forests? Yes, we could. Uh, one of the paradigms of Austrian forestry again is that is multifunctional uh, forestry. So, so we, we, we say, well, we, 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 are, we are so smart. We, we, we can have it all in one place. We, 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 we can uh, fulfill all the, the, the demands on, on the same lot of land. Um, what, uh, what you are saying is, should we, should we establish plantations, particularly for, 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 for the reason of uh, carbon sequestration? Yes, it's possible. Um, it changes our landscape uh, considerably. And to, to some degrees, it's already happening because this, this land use change that we, are, um, uh, that we have been observing this 10 times the size of Vienna in, in, in 60 years. This was actually... Uh, cropland converted uh, in, into forest land. Um, when we rely on this carbon sink uh, in, in, in forests as a, as a political um, agent, then we, 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 we know that we do not uh, have a very reliable contract partner because uh, forests are living systems. They may sequester as much carbon as we hope, but they also may, may be damaged for, uh, for some reason. And final remark, um, establishing new forests now is starting here, size. Uh, so uh, it, it takes about 40 years until 
uh, until the forest is really coming in, into this uh, this uh, time when he's absorbing uh, large amounts of carbon. So it uh, takes a patient observer. It does not help us very much to the debate what we do until 2050. Yeah, okay. thank you, Robert. I guess we have to wrap up um, and proceed. Apologies for the technical hiccups. Um, we will try to solve the issue with the pointers. Certainly, we won't need them now at the next talk, where I would like to introduce uh, Lucy Pau. We will move to our online contribution delivered uh, by her, who is Professor and Palmer Endowed Chair in Electrical Computer and Engine Energy Engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. She is also a corresponding member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. While one of her core interests lies in controlling and maximizing the energy capture of windmills, she has also a broad understanding of the potential of electric based renewable energy in a future energy system where, for instance, intermittency, the non-stable availability of energy in time, is one of the great challenges. She will now provide us with an overview on potentials and limitations of renewable energy. Lucy, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Wonderful, and you can see my slides, I assume. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, thank you so much for the nice introduction, and it's a it's a pleasure to to be participating remotely. Uh, so I'm in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, in here in Boulder, we're really at the front range of the Rocky Mountains. So as Victor mentioned, I'll be talking about renewable energy potentials and limitations. So Robert just uh, focused on bioenergy. And so I'm gonna focus on hydro, wind, and solar photovoltaics. And so first on hydro. Uh, so I think most everyone knows how hydro works, but just briefly, um, you know, uh, hydro works in the principle that we need certain uh, physical features, we need to have a high reservoir so that the water can flow downward to drive a turbine that can then generate electricity that can be put on the grid and transmitted to users. Now, at the end of 2021, uh, there uh, was uh, 1,360 gigawatts of installed hydropower. And I'm using end of 2021 data because that has been kind of verified and confirmed. And so it's, uh, I wanted to kind of have uh, even uh, official data all across the board. The 2022 data hasn't been fully uh, confirmed and, and, and validated. Um, so if we look at the decade from 2012 to 2021, there was an average annual growth rate of two and a half percent of installed hydropower. Uh, so it's a reasonable growth rate. Uh, if we look at installed hydropower around the world, this shows the top 10 countries and China's at the top there. Uh, in Europe, there's 224 gigawatts at the end of 20. 21 in terms of hydropower. And Austria has actually a good fraction of that uh, at 14.7 gigawatts of hydropower at the end of 2021. Now, one of the big advantages of hydropower, um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, oftentimes when uh, I present these power installations, people often ask, well, how much energy is actually produced? I like to pre present things in terms of installed power because that's then a very known number. We know how much hydropower capacity there is. The actual hydroelectrical energy that's generated can vary from season to season, year to year, uh, depends on many factors. Um, and so there's this quantity known as the capacity factor uh, that is the ratio of the electrical energy output over a period of time. So say the electrical energy output from a hydropower plant over a year divided by the maximum electrical energy output if we run that hydropower plant at its nameplate capacity, essentially at full capacity over the entire year. Now, of course, most power plants need some downtime for maintenance, repairs, and such. 
And for hydro, the capacity factors really have a wide range from about 10% to 99%. So it really depends on how much water is available. If there's not enough water available, then you can't run the hydro power facility uh, at times, and you can't run it at full capacity at times. So for hydropower, probably a typical average capacity factor is about 45%. So similarly for wind and solar that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to present installed uh, capacity. For wind, capacity factors vary from about 20% to 60%. Land-based Wind has somewhat lower capacity factors. Offshore wind has higher capacity factors because typically there's higher winds, uh, more consistent winds offshore. So maybe a typical capacity factor that we might use for wind is 40%. Solar photovoltaics has capacity factors that range from only about 5% to 30%. So it depends on cloud cover, uh, whether there's dust, sand, um, uh, interfering with the efficiency of the, of the solar panels. And so here, maybe a typical capacity factor might be about 15%. And so keep these in mind as I present the installed capacities of the different uh, generation types. So one of the big advantages of hydropower is that if there is sufficient water, we can control the amount of power that's generated in a similar way as for coal or natural gas plants. So if there's plenty of water and we don't need to be generating hydropower, we can actually hold the water up at that higher reservoir. So in a way, we're storing that uh, power for later usage. And that's not a capability that is uh, available for wind and solar PV. As mentioned already, you know, wind power is only available when there's plenty of wind. Solar is only available when there's sunshine. So let me just briefly then overview where we are with wind uh, capacity. So in a nutshell, wind power works as follows. So wind comes into the rotor plane and the design of the blades is such that as wind comes in, that generates lift that causes the rotor to spin. And that will then spin the low speed shaft. And usually there's a gearbox to step up to a higher speed to uh, essentially spin the generator, generating electricity. And then that's put on the utility grid transmitted to users. Usually, in terms of controlling wind turbines, the goal is to maximize power generation. While there's wind, we might as well try to maximize the, the power generated. Now, uh, the installed wind power capacity at the end of 2021 is as follows. And I'll just recap the numbers we had for hydro up here. And so at the end of 2021, wind power had was installed wind power was at about 60% of installed hydropower worldwide. However, the growth rate is quite a bit faster. So the average annual growth rate over the, the decade up through 2021 is more than five times the growth of uh, hydro. If we look at installed wind power capacity around the world, again, we see China at the top of the list there. In Europe, uh, there's about the same amount of installed wind power as installed hydro, and Austria has about 3.5 gigawatts of installed wind at the end of 2021. Now, let's take a look at solar PV. So, uh, a photovoltaic panel consists of uh, multiple layers of material that produce electricity when light shines on it. And a lot of the research in solar PV is trying to make these solar panels more efficient. So lower end commercial photovoltaic uh, panels have about 14 to 17% efficiency. You can buy higher end solar panels for uh, more cost to get to about 20 to 30% efficiency. Research laboratories have demonstrated actually close to 50% efficiencies, um, but there's still a lot of work in trying to commercialize some of these uh, new breakthroughs. And like uh, wind, a goal in solar PV is to try to maximize power generation. If the sun is shining, might as well try to maximize that power output from the solar panels. So in terms of installed solar PV capacity, uh, again, I'll recap the uh, numbers for hydro and wind. 
So at the end of 2021, solar PV it just exceeded uh, wind power capacity. But remember, the capacity factor for solar is actually quite a bit lower. The big uh, 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 large number for solar PV is that the annual growth rate is tremendously high right now. So over the last decade, about 26.6% annual growth rate. And again, when we look at uh, production by country, you know, China is again at the top there. Europe has about 184 gigawatts of installed solar PV. And Austria, at the end of 2021, uh, had 2.7 gigawatts of installed capacity. And my understanding is that 2022 was a big year in install installation of solar PV in Austria. I believe that uh, Austria now has more than four gigawatts installed. All right. So uh, if we take these uh, average annual growth rates and project forward and assume that we'll have these growth rates over the remainder of this decade, uh, we'll see the following. So hydro at the end of 2021, what had there was about 1360 gigawatts of installed hydropower. And at the uh, continued two and a half percent annual growth rate, that means we'll have about 1700 gigawatts of installed uh, hydropower capacity worldwide at the end of this decade. Wind uh, at the end of 2021 was only 60% of installed hydro, but has a much faster annual growth rate. So in a few years, it's expected to exceed hydro. Solar uh, has the fastest growth rate. And so we can see that by the end of 2030, uh, we expect at this same current annual growth rate to have more than 7,000 gigawatts of installed solar PV capacity. Now, there's a few questions we can ask is, you know, is this kind of current growth rate uh, enough to fight climate change? Is it not fast enough? Should we be going faster? And I'll leave that for discussion later. I'm not the expert on this. Uh, we can also ask the other question of can we actually sustain these growth rates? Uh, are the materials availability, manufacturing processes, uh, logistics, can those be grown continually at these growth rates? And so these are debates that are ongoing, uh, and I'd be uh, happy to, to discuss further afterwards. Now, you know, so, you know, hydro, wind, and solar, in particular, wind and solar have these healthy growth rates. Um, and so that's actually very promising in terms of trying to fight climate change. But one of the issues in terms of continuing at these fast growth rates is that integrating uh, wind and solar into the electric power grid is challenging because of the intermittency of wind and solar. Uh, and so, you know, what are the key issues and how can we try to address this? So traditionally, uh, the so on the on the power grid, we need electrical load and electrical generation to be balanced. And traditionally, that balance is achieved by controlling the generation to match the varying load. If there's mismatch, then that causes frequency variations on the utility grid. And so effectively, when you're measuring the frequency or looking at the frequency, deviations from the desired frequency is a measure of how imbalanced the generation and the electrical load is. The more imbalanced, the more frequency fluctuations there are, and that can lead to blackouts, which the utilities really try to avoid. Now, as we add solar and wind, that will add further challenges because of the intermittency of solar and wind. Uh, and so uh, typically wind turbines and solar PV arrays have been decoupled from the grid through their power electronics. And so in the past, wind and solar have not generally participated in trying to provide balancing services between generation and electrical load, though they can actually provide these services. There's a lot of ongoing research uh, it's been demonstrated that they can provide these services and there's further work in trying to improve how they can provide these services. So, uh, you know, I think they, they will need to be providing these services. And then the other thing going forward in as part of this uh, energy transition is as more 
more people have electric vehicles, there's oftentimes when many people are plugging in their vehicles, wanting to charge their vehicles, and that can increase the electrical demand by quite a bit. Uh, and so that then creates further challenges in balancing the electrical load and generation. So part of the problem with uh, wind and solar is the goal to try to always maximize power generation. And so, you know, the, the idea has been that if there's wind and solar, you know, wind is blowing, solar uh, sun is shining, let's you know, generate as much power and put it on the grid. But as there's more and more wind and solar on the grid, it really causes challenges in balancing the grid. And so one possible solution is to, instead of trying to maximize power generation from solar PV and wind, is to actively control the power that's generated from wind and solar. So the idea here is to derate wind and solar power plants. So they're not ap operating in their maximum capacity, but if they're derated, then you can control the power generated up and down to try to follow the power reference command that the transmission system operator is providing in order to try to help with those grid balancing needs. And so I've actually done some work in this area. So if I may just show some brief results, um, we actually, uh, you know, uh, came up with algorithms to control the power output of wind turbines to follow power reference commands. And we tested it on a 550 kilowatt wind turbine at the National Renewable Energy Lab. So ideally, of course, we want zero frequency deviation, right? In the US, we want to be at 60 hertz. In Europe, you want to be at 50 hertz. So we ideally want zero frequency deviation from that desired frequency. Of course, there are actual grid events that happen. And this is actual, we used actual uh, real uh, uh, real uh, frequency data from the Texas grid in the, in the US. And whenever there's a drop in frequency, that actually represents that some uh, generating source actually had to suddenly go offline for whatever reason. And that means the other generating units have to try to increase power production to try to uh, compensate for that event. And so what we did is we took 550 kilowatt machine, we derated by 10% so that nominally we're operating uh, at a lower level so that we could increase the power as needed. And so when we see that there's a frequency drop, we can compute the necessary increased power from the wind turbine to try to balance the grid and, and uh, cause the frequency to recover. And then we control the wind turbine to provide that power. And so we show that we could actually follow these power reference commands relatively accurately. There's a lot of noise. This is just a single term. And the idea is that across a wind farm, that that noise would uh, get smoothed out. So the same idea can actually also be applied uh, and developed for solar PV arrays. And actually, uh, this is work uh, of my colleague, Professor uh, Dragan Maksimovic here at U University of Colorado Boulder, along with his former students and uh, collaborators at NREL. And uh, again, ideally, you have zero uh, frequency deviation. They tested out with a quite a rapid drop, so one hertz drop in frequency over just a half a second period. And they had solar irradiance sensors that they could measure and estimate the possible power out of that solar array. They derated by 30%, so then they hopefully would have enough room to increase power as needed. But because this is such a drastic drop in frequency, turns out that the commanded power has to increase beyond the power that's actually available due to, you know, the available solar irradiance. And so in trying to track things, they're able to, to follow the commanded power up until they get to essentially the limit of the possible power. Since this uh, time of these results, uh, there has been ongoing work to improve the control to, to follow uh, a little bit more smoothly the commanded power. Uh, but the point is that solar and wind can try to provide these grid balancing services. Now, there are many other possible solutions as well, and I look forward to some of the other talks where they, there's actually um, uh, more knowledge by some of the other speakers in some of these solutions. 
Now, of course, you can always curtail wind and solar as needed to help with grid balancing. Uh, we try not to do that too often, or we don't want to do that too often, because that's a little bit of lost opportunity in producing clean energy. Another uh, possible solution is having more transmission lines. So as there's more wind and solar, uh, sometimes in one region, maybe there's not so much wind or sun shining at a particular time. But if there is availability of solar and wind elsewhere, having more transmission lines can help with that those balancing needs. Now, of course, transmission lines can be very expensive. And whenever you need to cross any border, uh, that can cause uh, some challenges politically. Wind and solar forecasts have been improving, and they will hopefully will continue to improve. Uh, because of the uh, chaotic nature of the weather, it's actually very difficult to uh, have uh, to, to try to achieve really good wind and solar forecasts for many days out for a long uh, distance into the future. Now, demand side management is something that has been explored. In some cases, it works well. In others, it has not uh, been so successful. Um, so in building systems, that's an area where it's actually worked reasonably well. So large buildings, uh, if they know it's going to be a really hot summer day and there will be peak uh, air conditioning command in the uh, demand in the afternoon, they can actually pre-cool that building early in the morning before there's that peak demand. And so then effectively, there's kind of thermal uh, storage in that building so that when we get to the hot afternoon hours, uh, there, the, that building won't have to demand as much power from the grid for air conditioning. And then, of course, there's been a lot of studies looking at time of use pricing, uh, different pricing strategies to try to incentivize users to shift their demands to uh, lower peak uh, times or lower demand times. And those have worked with a lot of mixed results. So it's not clear what the best way to, to, to do that is. And then, of course, the one solution we'd really like to see developed very well is to have electrical storage at the utility scale. So at gigawatt hour uh, or terawatt hour scale. So storage is already used at short time scales, seconds to many minutes. But at the really long duration storage where you're getting to storing for days or seasonal scale, that is still extremely expensive and hence not used yet. So I look forward to Garrick's talk later where he'll talk a little bit more about uh, storage uh, issues and, and approaches. Um, so I think we're all familiar that in terms of long uh, term storage, probably pumped hydro is the main uh, method that is actually reliably out there and, and being used, um, where basically when there's high demand, we let the waterfall down, generating that hydropower. But when there's very low demand for electricity and there's a lot of available, say, solar and wind, that power from solar and wind can help to uh, pump up water to the upper reservoir for storage for later use. Um, but as mentioned, you know, hydro and this pipe pumped hydro can only be installed in certain regions where you have those physical features of kind of large hills and drops. And so pumped hydro cannot be used everywhere. And so ultimately, we do need to develop good long term uh, storage options that can be used more generically around the world. And so in summary, you know, uh, hydro has been growing, wind has been growing even faster, solar has been growing the fastest among these three. Um, but there is a challenge of integrating in particular wind and solar at these fast growth rates into the power grid. There are many challenges. There are many solution possibilities. Uh, and ultimately, it will be a combination of all the different solution possibilities that will need to be uh, used to really make the entire system work well. So with that, uh, I'll close and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. We do have some time for questions. Gerhard. Thank you very much. Just a very quick question. Uh, you focused on electricity, but uh, geothermal energy, uh, you didn't mention it at all. Is it, is it totally unimportant or, or what's the future or the, the comparison? 
No, yeah, so that, that you raise a very, very good point. Uh, geothermal, I think, will be important going forward. Um, and that, of course, depends on availability. So it's not available everywhere, uh, but uh, it can be a very big source. So in Iceland, of course, it's it's a very big source of energy in, in several other places around the world. Um, and I think that there is, uh, I'm not the expert on this, but I, I, I believe there is a good amount of work being done um, and that they're trying to develop uh, geothermal energy in geographical locations where it is available. Thank you very much, Lucy. Verena speaking here. Um, there's two things. I think... Um, you mentioned only one type of hydropower. You did not talk about run of the river. Um, and also in a similar thing as I, I mean, th that changes the storage story. Um, but in a similar question as we, as I asked to, uh, Robert, what is the implications of, um, the climate crises on the availability of hydropower? Um, and I mean, oh, if you look at, point. if you yeah. look at Lake Mead, yeah, I think you've, you've got it there. Um, yeah. it depends on the availability of water. So do you have any ideas if, if your projections, which still show a little bit of an increase are by any means, um, too hopeful? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Uh, so in the U.S., the Department of Energy, uh, you know, has a, funding opportunity out now um, on trying to increase hydro and in particular trying to increase kind of the small hydro for kind of low environmental impact uh, hydro. And so I think because of these opportunities such as with our Department of Energy and imagine this is going uh, similarly around the world, I believe hydro will still increase um, but you raise a great question. I, I'm not the expert on that in terms of how, what is the available water? Uh, uh, you know, Lake Mead is definitely very kind of historic lows in terms of water. And so they can't necessarily run the hydropower facility uh, all the time or, or at the capacity that they want. And that is uh, a big question uh, going forward is, you know, is what is that hydropower availability? What can we predict the water that's going to be available? Um, are we going to have continued drought situations around the world repeatedly? Um, and I'm not sure what the answers are there. Uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, just one point, if you, talk, if you compare, let's say hydro to wind and solar, Shouldn't we also talk about land use and availability and use of raw materials? Yeah, that, and I think that's when I was asking the question, can we continue at these annual average growth rates? Uh, I think a big question is, yeah, the available materials. Uh, can manufacturing facilities be ramped up continually at the, this growth rate? And what are the logistics, right? The supply chain, transportation, and those issues. And uh, I think there is a lot of research going on in trying to uh, mitigate uh, the use of kind of rare ma materials and in trying to kind of find replacements of sort of more common materials. Um, but uh, there is still a question, right? So how well do these replacement materials work? And, uh, you know, again, can we sustain the continued growth rates uh, at the current levels. Yeah, only we have only time for one more question. I will take it from the online audience and apologize. I will also take only a part of that question in interest of time before we head to the break. That is regarding active power control. Wouldn't it make more sense to utilize the generated power through investing into sophistic sophisticated storage options for instance, electrolysis or adjusting use patterns on the demand side to generation patterns instead of artificially limiting the generation potential. Very good. Yeah. So I, I agree. There's a lot of discussion of wind and solar to X, right? So to, uh, for, for, uh, you know, 
um, hydrogen production, for instance, like you say, electrolysis and things like that. Um, so that, yes, that is definitely, um, being considered and actually being implemented already in, in a number of places. Uh, but I think the, the active power control I was talking about was to try to provide grid balancing services when it's needed. So I suppose you could have a facility, solar, uh, wind that does when there's plenty of wind and solar and not a grid balancing need uh, that's required, you can use that uh, clean energy for, you know, producing hydrogen and, and other uh, uh, types of uh, fuels, uh, clean fuels. And, uh, but that when there is a grid balancing need, then to use that extra solar and wind available to help balance the grid. So, Okay. These are kind of complicated uh, questions and trying to find that right balance and what is that overall kind of control scheme that needs to be uh, developed for that is, is still ongoing work. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you, Lucy, especially since that's an early time of the day for you. Um, we head to our well-deserved break now, and I suggest because we're a little bit behind, behind uh, the time, we reconvene at 4.20. So an extra five minutes as compared to the program. And yeah, I will be happy for the second part and hope to see you all again here in the Theatersaal. Thank you very much to the speakers and to the audience. Thank you.